Satanists are now saying that abortion is a religious sacrament for their practicing satanic religion. And the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the spiritual leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church walk into a meeting on climate change? No, that's not a joke. And neither is Jeff Bezos deciding to spend millions and millions of dollars in his own immortality project. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world, only two kinds, not black and white, not rich and poor. There are those who are dead in sin, and there are those who are dead to sin. After three nights of unbridled lawlessness across London, the contagion is spreading. The problem is that God has already judged this. He has judged murder already. I don't need to question it. I don't need to ask and wonder what his plan is. We're commanded as Christians not to participate in the works of darkness, but expose them. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we have a number of topics to discuss from the ultra-religious to the non-religious to the plain-out wackiness. And that is what we're going to be talking about. Specifically, I want to start with something that is not so wacky, but that which is evil. And that has to do with the recent, I guess, statement made by the Satanic Temple, TST, the Satanic Temple. And this is what they usually do. They try to look for headlines and to harbor kind of this disgust, which is exactly what they want. If they can't be famous, they wish to be infamous. And to harbor these headlines, they'll throw out these wild things. But the fact is, even though they say these things somewhat in jest, the fact is, is that there is a lot of truth behind it. And something that we have explained and exposed for a number of years are the absolute clear understandings of the parallels of people that were sacrificing their children to false gods like Moloch in the Old Testament over and over again. And doing so to these false gods, thinking that they're going to gain financially or so forth, and that honestly the fact is is that there's nothing new under the sun, and Satan has been doing that and convincing people to murder their children for reasons for a long time, reasons financial or otherwise, and that is exactly what is taking place. The same thing over and over again. We look at these old temples of old and say, oh, that's so disgusting that there was blood dripping from here and people were being sacrificed and all the things were going on, but yet we drive right by a Planned Parenthood. You drive right by these places. And the fact is, is that while this is in the news because of the Texas heartbeat bill that passed, and by the way, it is great that the bill passed, but the reality is, is that Life begins at conception, not at the heartbeat, but we do glorify God in the fact that babies, less babies, will be murdered, we hope, uh, because of this bill. And the fact is, is that for all of you who said, especially the pro-life evangelicals, who uh, the quote-unquote pro-life evangelicals for Biden, for all of those who helped to vote him in, saying we, we really believe this will be a great thing, uh, the fact is, is that Merrick Garland, who he appointed, who Obama wanted to appoint as a Supreme Court judge, has pretty much said, we'll do anything to make sure you can murder your babies. That's a fact. That's what's going on. And that's what you voted for. And that was the lie that you accepted and said, I want to be a part of this and actually campaign. It's one thing to vote or whatever. It's another thing. And I, even that I think is wrong. But it's another thing to literally campaign as a pro-life evangelical for Joe Biden. And I hope that now uh, you hear the, the roosting of the, of the, uh, the rooster, uh, so to speak, um, the sowing um, to destruction that, uh, that you did there in campaigning for such a wicked person, regardless of uh, Afghanistan and so forth, but um, absolutely just pro-baby murder. And that's what it is. Um, that's the reality of it. The fact is, is that 
Jesus Christ did die for those who have aborted their babies, and he loves those who have made that horrible decision to do so. And he did die for that sin. It's not the unforgivable sin. And I know plenty of women who love and absolutely adore Jesus Christ and regret, they do regret the fact that uh, their baby did die during an abortion that they chose to get, uh, maybe before salvation. Uh, And this is something that is, we, we need to always have it at our forefront, the fact that there is blood dripping down uh, the flag in America. Uh, ever since 1973, they've done it legally um, when Roe v. Wade um, went in to effect. And it is a sad and heartbreaking situation. And like I said, the Satanists that they are like to use this. And this is the statement that they made because they want to garner and get a lot of attention on their side when it comes to the abortion issue or when it comes to any issue that's coming up. And like I said, they don't mind being infamous and so forth, and they don't mind deluding people, and Satan doesn't mind laughing at them. That's the sad thing, because I do believe that a lot of the people involved in satanic temples think they're just rebellious and really funny, and we come against God, but really, I'm an atheist. But guess what? Anton LaVey, Aleister Crowley, they knew full well what was going on. Anton LaVey specifically stated when he was really kind of pressured by theistic Satanists, those who do believe in a literal Satan, when he was pressured by them, he basically had to say the truth that if he came out and expressed that they're really worshiping Satan, he wouldn't have anything to stand on. And there was only so much that he could say. And Aleister Crowley, in his biography, Confessions, made it very clear that he went to Satan's side and to this hour, that's the hour he was writing the autobiography, Confessions of Aleister Crowley, he said, to this hour, I cannot tell why? And sadly, Satan and plenty of people have different idols. Like I said, the days of old, they were sacrificing their children to Moloch. Uh, you may do it openly to Satan. You may think you're doing it to nature or whatever. Regardless, Satan gets it either way. And a lot of times he gets your soul. And because you've sold away your child uh, for whatever it is, so you can party longer. I actually know someone back in high school who got an abortion because her friend convinced her we can't party anymore if you don't abort this baby. I mean, some wicked things, wicked things. Mothers who've had children who just, I can't handle it. I need to abort this child because I can't handle taking care of more children and so forth when you could uh, have the baby even adopted if you really can't handle it or pray and know the Lord and he will sustain you. And it's just a heartbreaking thing. But nonetheless, I want to read from you so you guys understand. And like I said, well, it doesn't matter if they think this is in jest or this is just joking or, you know, it's trying to be funny here. But this is a reality, by the way. TST's membership uses these products in a sacramental setting. The satanic abortion ritual is a sacrament which surrounds and includes the abortive act. And this is something that is a reality. And in a footnote in a book that Aleister Crowley uh, wrote, he talked about the thousands and thousands of babies that he did sacrifice. And they do view, Satanists do view abortion as a means of sacrifice to Satan. Because that's what it is ultimately anyways. That's exactly what it is, whether they know it or not, whether they're in jest or not. The fact is, is that when you are doing it, you're doing it to Satan. These are false gods, the gods of the nations that you would give these to, whether it is you're believing and trusting in nature, whether it is you're believing and trusting that Satan, the father of lies, will actually protect you in some way, as Richard Ramirez thought, and other people who were actual Satanists believed that they were helping, he was helping them along. The fact is, is that this is the reality, that whether or not you know it, you are devoured and blinded by the God of this world and Satan has you by the grips. But this is what is awesome. In Colossians, the first chapter, we're actually told that Christ, when we come to Christ, we go from the dominion of darkness to the dominion of his marvelous light, his his marvelous son. We get to go to that dominion and be under true the true rulership who will ultimately come and step his feet on the Mount of Olives, who will make all things right, who will wipe away every tear. That's the promise I have including the tears of the repentant, the tears of the repentant mother who has gone through with an abortive act, who has gone and chosen 
to end the life. That's exactly what it is. That baby inside that womb is a life, and you mothers know it. I know my wife always tells me that. I've never had a baby growing inside of me, but my wife has told me over and over again, one thing that bothers her is that you as a woman, you know that that is a baby in there. You know there is a life. You know it's not just your body. If it was your body when you created, when you did an abortive act, your body, your choice, if it was your body, you would be the one who died, not the baby. This is sad. This is heartbreaking. I, I believe this is the innocent blood mentioned in Proverbs chapter 6 when God says he hates those hands that shed innocent blood. I believe he hates the absolute culture that we live in that from the, the milieu of the public school system who brings in people from Planned Parenthood to talk to kids. Don't think that doesn't happen. Um, the milieu of, uh, you know, Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and all of these groups where what your children are learning over and over and over again is that abortion is no big deal. Um, it used to be that you want to, they, they wanted the act to be very rare, Right. They wanted it rare. Now they, they they actually fired one of the presidents, uh, the more recent presidents of Planned Parenthood, because they were like, yeah, we got to get away from that campaign of rare. We want people shouting their abortions, bragging about killing their babies. Guys, we need, we need this to be a shameful act again. We need to make abortion shameful again. That's the reality, because we need it to come to a place where people recognize, and you cannot be ignorant on this anymore. With what we have now, think about Roe v. Wade in 1973 versus what we have now with 3D x-rays and so forth, or you're looking at this baby, right? And it's incredible. You see their facial structure, everything. Like, we are not ignorant. We know that's a baby in there. And when they were saying we're performing this so that it can empower the member to assert or reassert power and control over their own mind and body, this is exactly Right. This is the end goal of doing what thou wilt. This is the end goal of not allowing God and his will and saying, God, I just want to do your will. And guess what? Doing your own will. This is where it will end. If it feels good, do it. This is where it will end. All of the different lies, my truth, right? I just got to share my truth. Guess what? You don't have truth unless it is aligned with reality, and that reality is always going to be aligned with the one true God. And the one true God says that he hates the hands that shed innocent blood. So you need to not shed the innocent blood of that baby. It's just absolutely heartbreaking, and I hope you realize who you align yourself with, and this is exactly right, who you're aligning yourself with. When you decide, when someone decides to go and kill a baby— They are deciding to give that baby as a sacrifice to Satan, ultimately, or Moloch, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, the the God of inconvenience. You'd hate to be inconvenienced at all by a child. Absolutely heartbreaking. We just did a show recently on the artist Halsey, and one of the things she talked about is people were like, whoa, you're really young at 26 having a child. You have so much to accomplish and so forth, blah, 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 and one of the things she said, and by the way, she just came out with a openly satanic video. Absolutely. It looks like a demon literally got her pregnant and then actually takes the baby out of her. But the sadness is she's a very, very, very strong opponent uh, against uh, pro-life uh, laws and people that believe that women shouldn't have the right to kill their children. Uh, she's very against all of that. But one thing she says is, you know, you can't hug your awards you know, at the end of the night. And that's that's a reality. The inconvenience that a child might be to you, I mean, it is absolutely trumped by the joy that they bring. No matter what sadness happens um, with that child, the love that you have for them, it's just incredible. It's something out of this world that only uh, could be understood when you have that, have your own baby that you grab and hold on to or have just any old, any baby really, and you hold that baby and you see the life in them and to see them ending lives and bragging that this is a sacramental uh, setting, uh, these abortions and so forth. It's just it's just absolutely heartbreaking. And speaking of heartbreaking, um, the I guess the, the leaders of three of the top, um, the most well-known at the faces of the different systems um, 
the Catholicism, Pope Francis, alongside the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the the head. I guess the head is Queen um, Queen Elizabeth, but the um, the head of the church there as the Archbishop. And then what you had here also is the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Orthodox. So three of the most well-known systems of what the world believes is Christianity, they all came together, and they came together to combat abortion? No. Uh, to combat sin? No. Uh, to combat unbelief? No. No, it was to combat climate change. Yeah, you know, usually a joke starts out as, you know, a pope, uh, <laughs> an archbishop, and the leader of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, the the spiritual leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church, walk into a bar or something. But these guys walk together, hand in hand, uh, to make meaningful sacrifices to combat climate change. And this is a Reuters article. Quote, the world's three main Christian leaders issued an unprecedented joint appeal to members of their churches to listen to the cry of the earth and back action to stem the effects of climate change. In a joint message for the protection of creation, Pope Francis, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew asked Christians to pray that world leaders of the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November make courageous choices. We call on everyone, whatever their belief or worldview, to endeavor to listen to the cry of the earth and of people who are poor, examining their behavior and pledging meaningful sacrifices for the sake of the earth, which God has given us. Listen to the cry of the earth. It's really interesting because when I think about it, you know, creation does groan, but that groaning is longing is not for what this world offers. And for the believer, and I'm not saying Pope Francis is, I'm certainly not saying that, and I don't even like calling him Pope because he's not my papa, right? But the fact is, is that we don't ask other people of other faiths to pray. We don't ask them to give anything, really, uh, when it comes to this regard, because the prayers of the unrighteous, those who do not love God or know God or are seeking God, are an abomination to him. Uh, they're not. It's not like a blessing. It's not a fragrant aroma. In fact, it's a it's a disgusting aroma to God for those who even profess the true God, but then practice wickedness. And I think of uh, the book of Isaiah is very, very clear on this. And it's really interesting because in the beginning of Isaiah chapter one, it says this, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Now, I, I want to point that out to start. Hear, O heavens, and give ear to earth, because what's going to take place in Isaiah, the first chapter is Isaiah is given this vision and is, is he explains quite clearly that God brings the attention, just like, just like Moses did in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, that heavens and earth, right, they're, they're going to judge against you, okay? The heavens and the earth. And it says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. That's exactly what Moses said, that I have placed before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, so choose life, in order that you may live. That's Deuteronomy 30, 19. Now, once again, this is hearkening kind of the same message in Isaiah chapter one. And one of the things that he is doing here, that God is doing through Isaiah, which by the way, the book of Isaiah is just masterful. I mean, just amazing. If there was one thing that you should study, I, I really would encourage, I probably say this about every book, but specifically the book of Isaiah is just a masterpiece that God worked together. It's probably the most thorough books of the Old Testament in terms of theology. Uh, just just incredible. you got to check it out, it, and I encourage you to, to really do a deep dive into Isaiah because it, there's nothing, it is such a powerful book. But I want to bring out this, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Because the earth, the heavens and the earth do speak to us in a lot of ways. They It really does. But how does it speak to us? Because in Isaiah, the first chapter, First, God brings about this, this calling. Look at the heavens and the earth. Hear them, give ear, O earth. Hear them. Because God is bringing an indictment on his people. Because what he's saying is, my creation does exactly what I tell it to do. That's the point of Isaiah 1 that he brings out. That the things which I create, like the heavens, like the earth, 
that guess what? And even as Moses did in Deuteronomy 30, 19, calling them as a witness against you. What is that witness against them? The fact is, is that when God tells the sun to shine, it shines, right? When he tells it to go down, it goes down. And that is a fact. And it does it every time. The sun never wakes up and says, you know what, God, I don't really want to listen to you today. That's not what happens. What happens is every time God says do something, it does it. And think about Deuteronomy 30, 19 with me for a second. When he brings heaven and earth as a witness against them, what is it a witness against? What are the very next things? That I have placed before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life so that you will live. Think about this. Back to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Sons I have raised and brought up, but they have revolted against me. But the heavens and the earth don't do that. So first he starts with the heavens and the earth. Then he goes, verse 3, An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Think about this. He's pointing to the fact that when he creates something, quite clearly it does exactly what it's supposed to do. But even us humans, who he does give choice to, we choose to do what is wrong. But he, we can't even do what the heavens and the earth are doing, that they simply follow the commands that God gives them. And we are not doing that. But they always follow the commands. It's kind of interesting because this, this process is thought out in the early church multiple times. And I'm only going to quote from Justin Martyr and Irenaeus because both of them mention something very similar when it comes to the earth and its nature and what it does when God tells it what to do. And we as humans in their case for free will. He says that Justin Martyr says this, for not like other things as trees and quadrupeds, uh, which are four-legged animals, which cannot act by choice, did God make man? For neither would he be worthy of reward or praise did he not of himself choose the good, but were created for this end. Nor, if he were evil, would he be worthy of punishment, not being evil of himself, but being able to be nothing else than what he has made. So Justin Martyr's pointing out, we're not like trees. We have a choice, right? We, can, we, we, have, we obviously have a choice. This is something that is brought out in Deuteronomy and Isaiah, but it's one of those things, when we interviewed Dr. Robert Piccarelli, one of the things he brought out was the fact that free will is a very dangerous thing, right? Because the earth always does what it's told, right? The heavens and the earth always do what they're told. Irenaeus says it like this, for they were made rational beings endowed with the power of examining and judging and were not formed as things irrationally or of a merely animal nature, which can do nothing of their own will, but are drawn by necessity and compulsion to what is good, in which beings there is one mind and one uses, working mechanically in one groove, who are incapable of being anything else except just what they had been created for. That's why free will is such a dangerous thing, because we aren't like the plants. We aren't like the trees. We aren't like the animals even, right? We choose whether or not we are going to follow him. Choose this day whom you will serve. And guess what? The earth does exactly what God tells it to do. Go read Job chapter 38, right? When God explains to Job, where, where were you when I built the foundations of the earth? He explained to them that he set the boundaries and so forth. Over and over again, he can appeal to creation. But the fact is, is that if we don't seek him, and his righteousness, then none of these things would be added unto us. And we recognize that the groaning that the earth has right now, all that does is give us an appeal to groan for the coming kingdom, to groan for our Savior who is coming back for us, that we have on the helmet of salvation, recognizing that Jesus is coming back. And this just brings me uh, to Jeff Bezos real quick, because our hope is in the return of Christ. But when you are very rich and powerful and so forth, and you're the owner of Amazon, you have a lot of different ways that you need to try to, I guess, when you have all the money in the world, you have to make some immortality projects because you recognize eventually all that wealth is going to go where? Where exactly? I think the book of Ecclesiastes would be a great read for Jeff Bezos. But here is, here is something that is going on. This is on uh, futurism.com, but it's been covered by a number of people. Amazon and Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos is reportedly pouring millions into a mysterious 
anti-aging research startup in Silicon Valley. Efforts that are already earning him derision from space competitor and fellow billionaire Elon Musk. The startup called Altos Labs is looking into ways to reverse aging in human cells. That type of work has shown some promise, but is still in its early stages. Quote, and if it doesn't work, he'll he's going to sue death, Elon Musk chided in a tweet regarding the story. The fact is, is that we have covered this on a, on a more recent interview with Dr. Clay Jones on his book, Immortal. Because one of the things he pointed out is the millions and millions of dollars that from Silicon Valley specifically, not just Bezos, he's just the most recent one, that have been poured in and poured in and poured in for these immortality projects where they're trying to create a way for them to continue living on after they die. But here's the great thing. Everyone does, in fact, live on after they die. The fact is, though, some will go into perdition and others will go into eternal life with Christ and blessings abundant. And the sad thing is, is that we have this opportunity to show a Jeff Bezos the truth, to show an Elon Musk the truth, to show the person down the street, the homeless person, the Lazaruses of the world, and not just the rich man, the fact is, is that we have this hope in Christ. We have a living hope, and we know we're going to live with him forever. And so every single thing that happens on this earth can be minimized to absolutely nothing when we recognize the glories that are to follow. When we look at and recognize the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day, not in some private meeting, not in some vision, but it actually took place in time and space and did it in front of over 500 witnesses, according to 1 Corinthians 15, some of which entire attitudes change from running from little girls to running to be killed for the cause of Christ. And guess what? I can put all my faith, I don't need a single dollar invested in some immortality project that will never pay dividends, but I can put all my money, all my stock, and everything on the one who was raised from the dead so I know for a fact, without a doubt, what will happen after I die because the one who has come back from the dead and gave me life has told me so. And so I want to encourage you guys with that today, and hopefully you guys have been blessed. And uh, we are going to be at, and I'll try to update this as quickly as possible, we're going to be at the Ministries to Muslim Conference, which is called Our Strong Tower Conference, for today, tomorrow, and Sunday, and hopefully we'll be updating you on this page. So God bless you guys. We'll see you guys later.